In a remote region of northern India, a global mission pioneer uses a volleyball and a net as tools to reach his village. Pioneer DK had a dream. He wanted to establish an Adventist presence in this community where there were no Christian churches. DK started by creating a volleyball club. He collected a small participation fee so he could buy a volleyball and a net. Then he began teaching the young men to play. The word quickly spread about the club and the participants grew from 40 to 150 players. Today, this club is a major attraction among the surrounding villages. Mothers, fathers, and siblings, the whole family comes to watch the tournaments. This is my favorite game. Playing this sport always gives me energy. I like playing with my friends so much. We have good sportsmanship and this game unites us. The youth feel invigorated by the activities and they often come for training and exercises. This activity has a very good influence on the village youth. They must abstain from mischief and getting into trouble because those with bad habits are not allowed to play. The lessons they learn here go beyond volleyball. The players build character and confidence as they work together to improve their skills. Parents are also happy with the changes they see in their children. When DK comes to visit the families, their doors are wide open. DK often travels long distances on his bicycle. At times, he pedals 10 to 20 miles to bring the message of hope. Here, a group of mothers listens attentively as they learn about Jesus for the very first time. DK speaks with a sense of friendship and personal involvement that shows his love and interest for the villagers' well-being. The youth also look up to Coach DK. They are eager to hear stories of Bible heroes who won with God's help. The players often pray for their community and friends and for the games they play in. The game is a way to connect with the community and make friendships. I distribute pamphlets to gather the pupil. We also connect the games to the church and, at times, hold worship in the place where we play. Today, there is a small church in the village. Some 66 baptized believers meet regularly to sing, pray, and worship God. DK leads this group of believers during the week and in the Sabbath service. Pioneer DK's dream of growing a new group of Adventist believers in this community has come true. But he knows there is still much work to be done. And when he looks back at what God has accomplished in the seven years he's worked here, DK is confident that the future is bright. Please pray for the global mission work among the unreached people of Northern India. Pray for DK as he continues ministering through sport activities. We need many more pioneers working in these unentered regions. Around the world, Adventist education serves as a platform of opportunity for thousands of students. Schools provide quality education to inspire a brighter future. Beyond that, Adventist education shares an even greater hope with its students, a hope in Jesus. In many cases, students have come to know a loving God through caring and thoughtful teachers. Across the North American division, there are more than 1,100 Adventist primary and secondary schools. This territory spans over 12 time zones, from Bermuda in the east to Palau in the west. This gives Adventist schools the opportunity to serve students from various backgrounds and communities. In the southwestern region of the United States, Holbrook Indian School focuses on educating the local indigenous people. This school was established as a mission school for the unreached native groups of the Southwest. The majority of students who come to Holbrook are not Adventist and may have never even heard the gospel message. Many come from environments where they face negative influences, and some of these children grow up thinking drugs, alcohol, abuse, and neglect are normal. Their experience at Holbrook gives them a new perspective where they find caring teachers and staff, a place where they can just be kids and a place where they meet Jesus. Today, Holbrook is teaching students from grades 1 to 12 in practical ways. Their educational program has four pillars, physical health, 
mental health, spiritual health, and academic achievement. Each component is fundamental to the student's learning experience. In addition to core subjects, they offer classes like Native Cultural Studies, Welding, Woodworking, Auto Repair, Agriculture, Pottery, and Horsemanship. I don't want to be stuck on the res because once you're on the res, you stay on the res. And I want to start something new. The one thing my grandpa taught me is that God's there for you. You just keep looking forward, don't look backwards. That's why I came to Holbrook, and Holbrook's been my home. When I'm riding horses, it just feels amazing because it's silent, it's peaceful. The only thing you can hear is just the birds chirping and the breeze and the leaves. I feel, feel more myself. I mean, I conquered my fears on riding horses and stuff. And I have no reason to be scared of a horse because they're just horses. When I run, it just, it feels like home to me. I just like the smell of the trees and, you know, I could just, I like the feeling of the dirt. My brothers, they, uh, they drink and they smoke. Um, I don't like that. So I try to get away from it as possible. I decided I wanted to come to Holbrook. And when I got there, um, I noticed it was different. I noticed the kids there were a lot more different. They weren't so mean or so irritating. The teachers too, they were really different. They didn't seem so mean or they just seemed calm and um, nice. They really helped you with all your stuff, your education. I believe that this school provided more than just 100%. And I like that and it's, it's awesome. Holbrook Indian School continues to give students the chance to create a better future and find hope in Jesus. Please pray for this school and others across the North American Division, and thank you for supporting Mission. of the Amazon jungle, a school pulses with the love of Christ. Meet the EIE, Adventist Agro-Industrial Institute. The state of Amazonas is located in the north of Brazil and has the largest tropical rainforest in the world in addition to the Amazon River, which is 7,000 kilometers long. An hour away from the state capital, Manaus, is EIE, which was founded in 1964. There are 2,500 hectares of land. That's a lot of land. And because of that, this boarding school is focused on agriculture. We are now in our school with 40,000 acai trees. We are self-sufficient in milk, eggs, and vegetables. It is a school that produces a lot. It is a school where students have the opportunity to learn a lot in these areas. Here you will find different fruits, such as kupu asu and acai. But have you ever heard of these delicious fruits? Our team tried them and we approved. Acai is something different. What does it look like? It doesn't look like anything you know. Acai has its own wonderful taste, and kupuasu is a wonderful fruit. It's a little sour, but delicious. You can make juice or cream. It's a delicacy. It is a school that has few resources to maintain its more than 300 students. Most students have scholarships. The institution had the dream of having its own church because there was no place to gather all the students and employees. 
The difficulties were very great, and we met in what we call a chapel. It was a narrow, small, and very uncomfortable chapel. There was a need to have something broader, something capable of functioning as a church. And when I had the privilege of attending the inauguration of this church, a tear flowed for having known the difficulties of the past. And today, I understand that God was concerned about this school. That's why in 2014, 13 Sabbath offering funds from around the world were sent to help build this 500-seat church. It's a beautiful church to honor God's name, to promote mission, and to reach new people for Christ. Employee Jose Brazil arrived at the school in the 1980s and helped build this dream. Look, we work a lot in this church, right along with employees and students. We worked in the morning, in the afternoon, and at night. The entire community was involved, including the students, so that we would have this blessing that we're seeing today. Because we waited almost 50 years for this blessing, thank God it arrived. The inauguration took place in October 2016. Now the school is able to better nurture a spirit of mission in its students. Students love to sing, pray, and participate in church programs. They will be future leaders in their churches. They are students who come from different places, including Riverside communities along the Amazon River. I am from a Riverside community called Balm Sasesso, where 98% of the community is Adventist. Since I arrived, it was a dream to have a church here. I took part in carrying bricks, carrying rubble that was there. I took the students from the residential area to work. It was very cool. Today, the church is relevant to outside the Adventist community with youth training and councils. For students, involvement in the mission took a leap forward with the church being built. We have a project called The Caravan, where students have been going to the surrounding churches to preach, and in the afternoon we do social missionary work. This year we're taking a step further as an institution and as a church. We are establishing a missionary nucleus here. Last year alone, 20 students were baptized because of this church and they will be a beacon in their homes when they finish their studies. It took 50 years of a lot of waiting, a lot of prayer for the construction of this church. Brothers and sisters who sacrificed to send their donations know that for our community, for our school family, this money was very important. We sincerely thank every member of our church who has helped with their donations to build our church here. And we have grateful hearts today. And we also offer to help in other parts of the world to make this dream come true. Thank you for helping to build this and many other churches around the world. Fruits are being gathered for Christ.
Good morning, Church. In behalf of Spokane Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, we welcome you all to our services this morning. You here and also those that are watching online. May the Lord's blessing be upon us today. Amen. Let's approach God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we can thank you enough for this privilege that we have to come before you and worship you and glorify your holy name. Accept our worship today and open our hearts for your words, for your encouragement. Help us to be ready for your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We have lots of uh, announcement today, but we encourage you too to read it yourself just in case we don't announce everything here. You know, I need to do something special welcome to one of our sisters. I am so glad to see her. I was like so surprised. Sister Svetlana, where are you? There you go. She was been away for about three years. And went back to Russia and welcome back. She came back this week. So don't forget to say hi to her. Okay, we have a couple of announcements. Welcome to our children's church today. Kids, how are you? <laughs> so don't forget, when you do this, uh, come to the children's story. Just stay there because one of the leaders will come and pick you up so to, to lead you downstairs in the basement for the church, children's church. Deaconesses, please meet by the piano after the church today. So, Deacon says, please, right there. For a short meeting. <laughs> Abel said for a short meeting. I don't know. <laughs> and la next week, on Tuesday, there's a s board members. We have a meeting at 7 p.m. at the Fellowship Hall. Don't forget, Tuesday at 7 p.m. And then we have a special Sabbath coming next week. We have two young ladies that will be making their decision for Jesus in baptism. So plan to be here. Amen? Amen? And also our next fellowship meal is next week. So if you plan to bring some food, just don't forget to talk to Rich. Or you can read the bulletin for the things that needs to be uh, brought in the fellowship meal. And um, I think that's all that I can do. And there's a special announcement. I want Pastor Gerald, Gail, and Pamela to come up and let us know what happened last this week, last week. Did some of you pray for me this or for the, 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 the did you pray yeah. this week? Yes. God answered your prayer. God answered your prayers. Is this thing on? Yes. We asked you last week to just remember our little VBS in the Ruth Park. And um, the way the weather turned out, folks, we had the most beautiful week. You can imagine. Yeah. When there was hail and wind in a lot of places, we never saw, felt any of that. The children came out, and it was beautiful. How many were there, Pamela? We had about 36 children that registered during the week, which is more than we had here at our church for Vacation Bible School. Yeah. We were so excited to watch the children walk each night from the neighborhood. They just came, and they came, and they came. And when you look out into the crowd of the children, all the different beautiful colors of the rainbow that they are, I am so thankful. VBS in the park, of all the things that we do here at church, that is my very, very favorite thing to do. And I am so thankful that we had that opportunity this week. Yes, we did, and it was blessed by God and we just were so energized really by these children. We'll try to have a few slides for you next Sabbath so you can get an idea uh, of what was going on. We know they were praying because that first night Gerald went over to the apartments where the refugee children had yes, used to live and they yeah. kind of all mostly moved away. And, and always before when we've done that we've come back with you know, a dozen, 15, sometimes 20 children. Only this time he came back with no 
children. Not one single child. And he said to me, Gail, I think we're done with this. And then what happened, Pamela? They came and they kept coming every night. So <laughs> we are so grateful. Uh, we need to t say a word about God's Closet. Yes, God's Closet is the shop day is tomorrow. And if any of you would like to come and help sort, we have still a mountain of clothes that are not sorted yet. So if any of you could come and sort during, during God's Closet, it's on from 10 to 1 tomorrow, and we can use lots of help sorting those clothes that are still not out on the tables. We ask with certain boldness because I don't know who was responsible this week for getting things from the basement to the... It was the Sumapong family. Was it the Sumapong family? Ask Rachel family? what she did. <laughs> not me. I <laughs> Where? Here, come here. Some of our missionaries are very humble and, and very generous with their time. But th somehow the stuff downstairs that needed to be up on the main floor. I think this lady got up knows. There, so. uh, this lady knows. So it was Abel and Shane and Miles, Rachel, Katrina, and myself. I just want to thank the Summa Peng family, don't you? Yes. There were hundreds and hundreds of bags to bring up, so thank it's, you very much. It was much. a mountain. <laughs> thank you very much. This church loves children. Amen. Not only this church, but our conference loves children. Next Saturday, they're setting aside this day for us to pray for our kids. If you can see that in the bulletin. In the bulletin. Now, before we collect our offering, the people downstairs will play some slides on, and pay attention to the. Hi there. I want to tell you about the day I met Jesus. He came to my town and he spoke to me with such kindness and respect when he asked to take my hand. I felt his touch as we stood and he gently led me outside the village away from the crowds. I know it sounds strange, but he used his own saliva and touched my eyes with his hands. And then he asked me, do you see anything? I lifted my face towards Jesus and the nothingness began to fade. Splotches of color and shapes appeared. I said, yes, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Jesus touched my eyes again, and when I opened them, everything became clear. That day, the miracle was more than my sight. In that moment, I saw the face of the man who changed my life. Christian Record Services for the Blind is an official ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America. Our mission is to empower people who are blind to engage their communities and embrace the blessed hope. Empowering someone begins by introducing them to Jesus, the one who brings them value. Our ministry serves people who are blind or experiencing vision loss by providing books, Bibles, and magazines in accessible formats, including Braille, large print, and audio so that people can choose how they want to learn more about Jesus. We help people find their value through adventure at National Camps for Blind Children, operating with camp partners across the United States. Most importantly, they find peace with Jesus by spending time in nature. We connect people with shared experiences through phone faith, created by and for people who are blind, presenting 17 call-in programs every week to inform, encourage, and inspire. Christian Record Services exist to share the good news of the gospel with people who are blind and to help those who know Him strengthen and grow their relationship with the man who changes lives. Hi, it's me again. Yeah, the trees walking around guy. I forgot to tell you something important. Do you know how I came to meet Jesus that day? It all started with my friends. When they found out he was where we lived, they took me to him and begged him to heal me. Yep, 
My friends helped me find Jesus, and He changed my life. Today, you have the opportunity to bring someone to Jesus by supporting the ministry of Christian Record Services for the blind. Will you consider a gift to Christian Record Services? Your gift will empower people to learn, grow, and connect with the one who can change their lives. Thank you for being the feet and hands of Jesus. We will pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the abundant blessing that you have poured out to us throughout this week. And as we return our tithes and give offering, help us to do it faithfully. Bless the offering that we will have today. In Jesus' name, amen. The kids can come up now and collect your children's uh, offering. And then be ready for the story. children happy sabbath could everyone scoot a little closer to the middle please thank you okay today i want to talk to you about nothing separating you from god's love nothing can separate you Today our story is about Rebecca. From her bedroom window, Rebecca saw the children playing in the snow. How she longed to play with them. Now Rebecca, you can't play in the snow today, Father says. Why not, Father? Just trust me, Rebecca, it's not 
what's best for you today, father replied. At the time, Rebecca had responded by kissing her father and saying she would stay in the room to read a book. But it was beautiful outside, she thought to herself. Why wouldn't father let me go out to play? Why should she have to miss out on all the fun? Then suddenly a snowball exploded just outside her window. Rebecca decided she couldn't stand it any longer. She simply had to join the fun. Leaving her book on the table, Rebecca slipped outside. She tried to tell herself she was having a good time. But all the while in her heart, she felt uncomfortable. She kept looking this way and that way, seeing if she would see her father. After a few hours, Rebecca finally said goodbyes and she headed toward the house. She wanted to be safely lodged in her room before father got home. Intent on getting to her room as quickly as possible, Rebecca didn't see a mitten someone had left on the stairs until her foot slipped on it. Next thing she knew, she was falling down the stairs. To her horror, she noticed that she had hit her father's favorite picture. And when she fell, a huge gash was ran right across the front of the picture. Normally, Rebecca would immediately hurry to her father after such a fall so he could fix her wounds and make her feel better, but not this time. How could she face her father right now? She had disobeyed, and she had ruined his favorite picture. Biting her lips, she tried not to cry. She rushed to her room, limping, carrying the ruined picture. For the remainder of the day, she lay in her bed in agony. Her body ached and bruises, and was bruised. She received from the fall, but her heart ached worse. She felt certain that her father would no longer love her. She had messed up in the past, but certainly this time she had gone too far. He would probably never want to speak to her again. How could, she, how could he still love her? She sobbed uncontrollably on her pillow. She had always been close to her father. They had played and studied together. They had laughed and cried together, but not now. No, she felt certain that all those wonderful times were over. Who knows how long she would have laid there had not her nanny come in to check on her. Rebecca's nanny had a way of finding out exactly what was wrong. Tonight was no exception. Rebecca, dear, she said firmly but gently, you have been very wrong, but you must not continue in your wrongness by sitting here. You must go to your father with the broken picture in your hand and tell him everything. Oh, but I can't. I'm, I'm not worthy of his love, she sobbed. Her nanny said, sighed patiently. You were no more worthy of his love yesterday than today, child. Your father loves you because you are his daughter, not because of anything you can do or don't do. Hasn't he told you every day since you were a little girl, I love you? Do you doubt his word? Hmm. Doubt his word. That was something Rebecca had never thought of before. Maybe she should go to her father. Yes, she must go see him. For she, if she didn't, she never would be able to rest. So still shaking and trembling with fear, Rebecca limped down the hall to the living room. She paused at the door. She could see her father sitting in his favorite chair, just like he did every night. She looked in, and when he saw her, a smile radiating with love illuminated his face. Oh, you have come at last. I've been waiting for you. Come, sit here. As he spoke, he opened his arms widely. Rebecca couldn't stand it. Oh, you don't understand, Father. You, you can't love me anymore. I have been disobedient. Rebecca held up the picture frame to her father, for her father to see. I know, Rebecca, more than you think. I watched you go outside. I watched you fall and hit the picture frame. I saw it all. You did? But, but weren't you at work? Her father shook his head. I took the day off to spend some special time with you. That's why I told you not to go outside to play. Ever since I saw you fall, I've been longing for you to come to me and 
so I could bandage up your wounds. Won't you come now? Rebecca could hardly believe her ears. Her father had planned to spend the afternoon with her, and she had missed it. Yet her father knew it all and loved her anyway. Could it be? But father, how can you love me now? Rebecca, father smiled, and she would never forget his smile. Rebecca, dear, I love you before you were born. You are my daughter. I will always love you. Although sometimes your actions will result in consequences you could have avoided. Nothing can separate you from my love. Now, won't you come and let me help you with those bruises? Children, I want you to remember today in Jeremiah 31, 3, God has said, I will love you. I love you with an everlasting love. And also that there in Romans 8, 35 and 37, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, peril or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. Remember, no matter what you do, even when you do something and your parents tell you not to do it, God still loves you, and they love you too. So remember, let us always be obedient to the best of our ability. And remember, we are loved. Okay, we have children church. Your teacher is waiting. Have a good Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Okay, we're kind of alive this morning. Okay, thank you. Somebody is more alive on that side. Um, this is the time of our service where we can actively worship with the voices God has given us. So I'm going to invite you all to stand, and we're all going to sing this morning. The first song today is In My Heart There Rings a Melody. It's an oldie but a goodie. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, mm -hmm, yep, and give you a tender, responsive heart, and I will put my spirit in you. In my heart, our new heart, there rings a melody. I have a song. marvelous deeds you alone are God teach me your way Lord that I may rely on your faithfulness give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name I will praise you Lord my God with all my heart 
I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. Join us as we sing our next song, How Marvelous, How Marvelous is His Love for Us. Last song this morning is a praise song that's actually been around for a couple years, but it's going to be a new one that I, I hope we sing more regularly here in our congregation. As we worship this morning and as we go through this upcoming week, I hope this is one of the songs that we continue to sing to remind us how God has been good to each of us. Um, the title of the song is The Goodness of God. And if you aren't familiar, just follow along with the lyrics and then join when you're comfortable. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Cause all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been good So good With every breath that I am able Oh I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known 
you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my of the goodness of God Cause your goodness is running after it's running after me Your goodness is running after it's running after me With my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you is running after it's running after me all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Happy Sabbath. What a joy it is to sing of the goodness of God. In the junior class this morning, Anosha draw, drew a picture of a volcano. Last week on our uh, trip to Vancouver, we went uh, by Mount St. Helens to see a volcano that had erupted in 1980. Many of you were aware at that time, or were around at that time, I wasn't, so I wasn't quite that aware of what took place but we saw some of the devastation. And then while we were at the North Pacific Union uh, offices, there uh, uh, Dr. Stan Hudson has a creation sciences exhibit, and I encourage par parents in particular, uh, if you're going over to Vancouver, Portland, in that area, call and make an appointment, go by and see that because I think you'll find it very instructive. They have exhibits on uh, fossils and, and, and discussion of, of uh, the volcanoes and uh, we have live exhibits here in the Northwest. For those of you who are able to join with me, uh, let us kneel before the Lord our God. Gracious God, our fathers, we come before you this morning. Yes, Lord, we want to sing about and proclaim the goodness of God. Oh, Lord, we father, our Father, we praise you and we thank you for gracing us in Christ to train ourselves for godliness. Knowing that godliness of, is of value in every way as it holds promise in our life now. For Lord, you tell us in scriptures that you have for us love and joy and peace, and patience, kindness, and gentleness. And not only in this life now, but for the life to come. And we pray that you will grace all the members of our congregation and our neighbors all around us and across our city to live in this joy. Oh, Lord, we live at a time when there is disrespect for life with violence, hatred, corruption, pollution of all kinds. Lord, but Christ and all his people, all of us at Central Church and our brothers and sisters in the Lord beyond uh, our, our neighborhood and across our city, 
let us stand for a culture of life. You tell us that knowledge makes us feel important, but it is love that strengthens our church. So let us be strong in you, O Lord. And we pray as the children go forth, they are down in children's church now, Lord. Watch over them and care for them. Open their minds and their hearts unto you, O Lord. We pray for them as they prepare to return to the classroom in a, in a few days. Perhaps some with lingering doubts of what to expect. For their lives have been topsy-turvy for the past couple of weeks. May it settle down and they get back to uh, school in a more normal way. And let it be a joyful time for them as they return with their teachers and friends. And Lord, we pray for those who are sick and cannot be among us today. We remember Ron Livingston. Remember Lonnie, Russell, and there are others who are, are shut-ins and may not. Daryl Klein and, and his wife and um, Eric and Linda Schweitzer and, and others, Lord, and we pray that you will watch over them. And Lord, what a joy. We come to, to church on Sabbath at a lot of times. Lord, we are seeking your joy, and it was a joy today. For there was Svetlana standing in front of me. What a pleasure that is, that she has returned to us. I'm not sure for how long yet. We hope forever, but you know her schedule, Lord, and we thank you that you've brought her all the way from Russia to Spokane. And you will bless her and keep her in all her activities. Bless her family, Lord. And we thank you. We pray for our city and our neighborhoods where there is anger and anxiety and fear and doubt that creeps into the crevices of our lives. There are people who are homeless. There's a place called Camp Hope. And we pray that your hope was spread across to every individual in, in, in Camp Hope. We pray for wisdom and strength to better serve you, O oh Lord. We have a church board coming up on Tuesday, Lord. We need your wisdom. We need your direction. Lord, and we pray also for God's closet tomorrow, for those who are, are working and making sure that God's closet runs appropriately and wisely. And pray, we pray for all those who are coming. Let them come and find what they need for their families. Bless them and keep them. And let them know that thou lovest them so much and care for them. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Greg, for he and Diana are, in process, are traveling this weekend for a family event. Bring them home safely, Lord, as we thank you and love you. And as Pastor Gerald comes forth to break the word of God, oh Lord, send thy Holy Spirit, speak through him, and let thy Holy Spirit touch your hearts and mine as we love you and look to you and trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Everyone having a good day so far today? Every day is a good day, isn't it? I'm going to do something that preachers like to do. God is good. Well, that works really good. And all the time? All right. Before I sing, I believe this is the first time I've sung a solo here. And usually, if I sing someplace for the first time, I like to make a little announcement. So if you bear with me just for a minute. It doesn't matter to me if you remember my name. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to bring you a message. And so my point is I want to make sure you get that message. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the song first. The song is called Were It Not For Grace. So the song is about grace. But I want to remind us all of something. Grace was given to us because we need to be saved. 
We cannot save ourselves, but that does not mean there is not a work for us to do. We have a work to do. The difference is, by whose power do we do it? The song here is pointing out that we cannot do it all by ourselves. We need Christ in our life. But with his power, we can live a life that God would have us to live. So that's my message for you this morning, were it not for grace. Time measured out my days Life carried me along In my soul I yearn to follow God But knew I'd never be so strong I looked hard at this world to learn how heaven could be gained. Just to end where I began, where human effort is all in Were it not for grace, I can tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go. The battles I would face, forever running but losing the race, were it not for grace. So here is all my praise Expressed with all my heart Offered to the friend Who took my place And ran a course I could not start and when he saw in full just how much his love would cost he still went the final mile between me and heaven so i would not be lost were it not grace I can tell you where I'd be wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me I know how that would go the battles I would face, forever running but losing the race, were it not for grace, forever running but losing the race. Were it not
blessed my heart. Did it bless your heart? Yeah. Appreciated the prayer and the music, Rachel and Kat. I am always blessed by your sharing. The message is big enough, isn't it? That it takes all of us to be able to express this in a way that um, just isn't too small. It's a big message. It's about a God that is so large, so big, so loving, so merciful, so gracious, we can't ever be able to express it. But we keep trying. We keep trying anyway. So thank you for being here today, and thank you for the opportunity just to share together a little, about, a little bit about God, money, and, and me. Um, you know... <laughs> It's kind of ironic that I would be standing up here and my good friend and colleague, Andrew, sits down here in the pew. He's our department leader in this area and I appreciate, I've heard some of his presentations. And Andrew, I think it's preposterous that I'm here. But I've had to laugh at the whole set of circumstances and say, you know, God has his own sense of humor in these things sometimes. And I felt compelled to do this. I felt that this is what God wanted me to do because we're living in a very interesting, unsettled time financially. Just a lot of things happening, aren't there? And as Christians, I think most of us in here, we realize that God is involved in this matter of our livelihoods and the way we earn money at all. But the pressure gets on sometimes. And, and there are all kinds of circumstances that come along that make money and the way we spend it um, kind of dicey. So this is just kind of an opportunity to go back and relook. I am not expecting here to come up with all kinds of brand new ideas that you've never thought of before. That is not what I'm going to try to do at all. Um, I want you to just kind of review this with me and think about these principles. And I believe God has something just a lot more personal in this financial picture than we often realize. So maybe some of this will come through. And we did, a, we did a handout, and disregard the color because some are green and some are gold. We ran out of the greenbacks. So we went to the gold standard, OK? So don't worry about the color. The color makes it, it's totally insignificant. Isn't that right, Rachel? Yeah. So I hope that uh, it will be a blessing to you. Let me pray, first of all. Lord God, you are a magnificent God, and we've sung about you. We've, we've spoken with you. We've prayed. We've listened to your voice. We've listened even to the children's story of how good you are. And um, we're here again today just recognizing that we need to be continually reminded to keep our hearts and minds focused on you. So, Lord, please be here. Um, by your Holy Spirit, and speak to our hearts. Help us to live in a way that will truly honor you and in which we will discover your generosity in even a greater way than we ever have. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's look at the purpose. It's simply to clarify the Christian's relationship with money. Notice the word relationship. That is so important. We're not just talking about dollars and cents. It goes much deeper and much more personally in that. And as I went through and thought about what I'm sharing with you here today, it kind of boiled down or distilled down to three questions. And you have them there on your green gold sheet. <clears throat> Number one, what is money? Number two, what does God ask me, why does God ask me to give him my money? Why? And number three, 
how will biblical money management affect me? So those are the three questions we'll be dealing with. I, my prayer is that at the conclusion, you will have some insight in all of those, even though some of that may not be new to you at all. And before I get too far into this, a special thank you to you, Rachel, for helping me get this thing all together. Because I'd have never had this handout for sure without her decided um, attention and, and, and skill. So good. And, and um, so, thank you. I feel better when I show gratitude, Rachel, okay? She shakes her head. <laughs> I guess the thing that really gets our attention today is this. It hurts what's happening. And we're reminded every time we go put gas in the car, right? Anybody here, anybody here not notice the, ch the difference in that? Well, I hope not. There is like a 60% difference of in June, you know, over, year over year price increase. And so it, it's all broken down. I'm not going to read through all of it. But all items kind of come out at a 9.1% uh, inflation rate. And um, so that gets our attention immediately. So Americans are they're having money problems. We're having some challenges. Let's face it. Let's not try to be, you know, indifferent or ignorant to the reality around us. Let me just mention a few of these. The three richest Americans have more money than the poorest 160 million Americans. There's something very un-American about that. Something has definitely shifted or slipped a cog somewhere in our society. Credit card use is on the increase. Uh, every time I turn around, I hear different things about this. But basically, what we're doing is building the debt bigger and bigger. And I think we've learned good lessons from our government, which is now, what, 30 trillion plus in debt? I, I, I mean, every time they, they give that little, uh, um, what is it, little indicator, and you see the dollars adding up, makes me dizzy looking at it. Um, so indebtedness has become almost a way of life for many, many Americans, and probably for for some of us sitting here in this sanctuary today. The vast majority of Americans are two paychecks removed from bankruptcy. Ouch. That's not the way God wants us to live. And so we have some of these things that just are kind of nibbling away at us. Um, reminds me of, of uh, one author I was reading about this, and he said, well, it just, you know, this is like um, some of these insects that get into the wood, they keep gnawing away on the inside. We don't notice it on the exterior, but it's working on the inside. And um, that's, not, that's not good because it may look like the facade's gonna stand fine, but actually the inside, it does not have the integrity necessary. So what does that all say to our society? Well, number one, there is great power in money. Do you agree with that? Yeah. yeah, there is. Either for good or evil. Okay. Money really has neutral value. It's people that make it good or bad. And I was reminded of a story. I just heard this the other day on the news. This little boy, about 11 years old, he set up a lemonade stand. And uh, he was doing pretty well. It was a hot day. People wanted lemonade, and they were coming by. And he kept putting the change in his $1, $2 uh, sales, you know, into his, this little jar. And, and so he took it out a little bit and counted it, getting toward the end of the day. Well, he had about $85, and he was standing there kind of congratulating himself because that was more money that, it, that he'd ever seen that he could call his own. And he looked at the jar, you know, and a man came up and said, um, so you have $85. He said, how would you like to sell me 
some lemonade for $15. Old boy thought, ooh, good deal. I mean, 15 bucks for a glass of lemonade? Sure, so he made up the lemonade, and the man said, fine. Took out his billfold and handed him a $100 bill. Sounds, everything sounds good, right? He said, give me, um, give me your change. Give me what you have in your jar. So the little boy dumped his $85 into the man's hand, and the man went down the street, and the little boy had the $100 bill. He went to the service station close by to break it and found out it was a counterfeit. Good, sounded good, right? It can, it can do good and wonderful things. It can do very bad things. So money in and of itself really has neutral value. It's powerful. It can accomplish all kinds of things. <clears throat> but what we do with it is people. Ah, that's what makes the difference. We all come into this earth with two resources. What are they? Let's hear it. Time and talent. And sometimes we may not like it very much, so we're going to let the world know, as this little one seems to be doing. <clears throat> it was Mel Reese, and Mel, um, did any of you know Mel Reese? I, I just, not very many, I'm surprised. Mel worked in the area of stewardship for years and years, and when I was quite a few years younger than I am now. I worked in stewardship for a few years. And I learned from Mel so many wonderful things. And uh, this is one statement that he made that I still see as a fundamental principle to this matter of stewardship. Life then is an expenditure of time and talent. However, money is also the result of an expenditure of time and talent. It is a tangible result of the use of time and talent. Therefore, money may be considered as life, for it is composed of the same components, life and money. Isn't that interesting? Um, <clears throat> Sorry about that. I want to put this into an equation for you. So it looks like this. Time plus talents equal life. Time plus talents equals money. So what follows? Yeah. Therefore, money equals life. So they truly interact. And the, really, this is the answer to the first question you had on your outline there. What is money? It's life. The life that God has given us. God doesn't need my money. I'm going to move on to this next point. He does not need my money because he owns it all. Now, I know at church we often talk about the fact, well, you know, we need to remember that the gospel has to be spread, and we need your dollars to help do that. And sometimes we'll talk about, oh, we need to repair the church. You know, paint needs to be repainted, and, and the carpet needs to be replaced. And, and then there are ministries that we need to carry out. And it kind of feels like after a while that we are paying our dues when we're taking up the offering. Um, we even say, oh, but the pastors have to be paid their salary. And so we, we struggle with this just a, a little bit. But God does not even need one cent of our money. And let's look at it here together in Genesis 1:26 to 28. When God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us, and they're going to reign over the sea and the birds and the sky and the animals. And they are going to 
be created in our image, in the image of God. Male and female, they will be created. And God will bless them and they will be fruitful and multiply and they're going to fill the earth. And then notice the little word reign. They're going to reign over the fish of the sea and the birds and the animals. But you say, well, that's Old Testament. But you know the New Testament sounds the same way. Paul says in Acts 17, he is the God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in man-made temples and human hands can't serve his needs. For he has, how many needs? He has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything and he satisfies every need. So Paul reminds us of what Genesis first set out to do. We are not creators. We're not sustainers of all of this. We are what? We're managers. God made us managers of the life that he has entrusted to us. I also really think that we need to keep in mind John 3.16 here. For this is the way God loved the world. God is the kind of a God he is, first of all, because he is a God of love. And the love that he talks about is one that he just didn't talk about, is one that he acted on. Because he gave his one and only son. This is a verb, but this is a word of action. He gave his son. So God in his love and his goodness, God is a God of great generosity. He's very generous with us. You agree with that? Yes, he's very generous. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. <clears throat> so, having said all of that, if God doesn't need our money, why does he even ask us to give it? That is the question that still needs to be answered. And I believe the answer is because in giving it to us, he gives it for our benefit, not for his. <clears throat> Let me, um, let's talk about some of these. Number one, uh, and I think you will find on your handout there, giving for our benefit, that's on the first page, number two, you're going to find uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28 is what I'm going to uh, recommend. And we just read it, so I don't need to go back through it again. Um, but every time we choose to give, we are reminded that God is our creator. He is our creator. He is not asking us to try to create something. He's, he's saying, look, I just want you to manage it. I want you to take care of it. When we fail to give, we are acting like we're the owners. When we do this, we are stealing God's identity. Ever heard of identity theft? I think we're involved in it today in America in a big way. Identity theft. We act like we own it. We act like we're in charge. Let me go to the second one. It's given to us for our benefit. Demonstrates the freedom of dependence. Now I know that sounds like a, maybe a misnomer, but that's what I mean to say, the freedom of dependence on God. Matthew 6.33, I think most of you know this one by heart probably, but you can look it up in your Bibles. I don't think using your Bible is a bad thing here at all. Matthew 6.33, seek ye first, what? The kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and what? And all of these things will be added onto you. You're going to have everything you need. So giving is an act of trust. It's an act of trust. And God says he will take care 
of our necessities, our life, our food, our shelter. When we give first, God will fulfill his promise. So that has a lot to do with belief and trust in him. And then, so that helps us as a benefit. Number three, it helps us understand that giving brings blessings. Sometimes we have a hard time remembering that. Um, sometimes we think, ah, I've got to do without some things. But uh, look that one up there in Luke, will you? Luke 6.38. This is a, a verse that ought to help us in this time of inflation, I think. Luke 6.38. Give, and you will receive. Thank you, I hear some Bible pages. Your gift will return to you in full. Pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. So what does that verse tell you about God? in his generosity with us. Are we going to outgive him? No. Don't think there's a chance. This verse tells me this is a promise that God will always outgive. If we are faithful in our giving, he will outgive us in returning. You know, the, the measure, they, they said that that kind of came from the idea that they would um, put their grain in baskets and in order to get a full measure, they would take it and they would shake it. Or they would do this sometimes with it, bounce it up and down, press it so it pressed down, and then, then shake it, and then fill it to the brim. Then you got a full measure. So God is just trying to reassure the people there of his time, I believe, that they were going to get a, a full measure in response to his promises. Let's look at one more. It challenges our, what is that? Consumeristic. We like to consume things. We're consumers. And uh, many of us have lived in this culture all of our lives. And, you know, if you need, some, you need something, well, it used to be you just go downtown or you'd watch the newspaper or whatever, but today, what do you do? Yeah, you go online, right? And you look around until you find it. And um, if you want to do it really, really, really quick, there's always Amazon, right? We consume. We are really, really, we have ad adapted to this change, and everything's fast. So we can have it, like, immediately. So, giving challenges our mindset on being consumers. Um, let me take you to one other verse in Luke 12. On the consumer... I want to read this story here. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Can you almost hear the whine in his voice? Lord, this isn't fair. My brother's being a big bully. He's always gotten his own way, and he's always gotten more than his fair share, and he's going to do it again. So will you please intercede for me? Well, Jesus replied, friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? That's an interesting response. Then he said, beware. Maybe this is the part we need to remember more than anything else. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. 
Then he told him a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room in all my cr for all my crops. And then he said, I know. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and all the other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, oh, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now, take it easy. Eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night, and then who will get everything you work for? And then verse 21, perhaps the most important verse in the story. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. When he tells the story, when the man is faced with this personal dilemma, how does he resolve his problem? What's he doing to resolve it? He's talking to himself. He's just talking to himself. Does he talk to God at all about it? Does he talk to a friend maybe or a family member or anyone else? No. Notice how when you read through it, what am I going to do? I don't have enough room in this barn. I mean, my crops, they're so beautiful. I know, I'll tear down my barns. I'll have, soon, I'll have room enough to store all my wheat. I'll sit back and say to myself, this is all self-consultation. He's full of himself. And that's all he can see. So it challenges our consumer attitude, this matter of giving. Um, I think the final verse that we have on that sheet there is in Romans 12, 2. We're all faced with a real question, just like this, just like this man was. Should I build my kingdom? Or should I build God's kingdom? That's the question. And this is the, perhaps, one of the most profound verses in all of the Bible about changing of the heart in this matter. Don't be conformed to this present world. Don't be, don't be just squeezed into the mold, is the way the Phillips translation says. If the world is greedy, be careful that you not slip into the greed of the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. God is the one who can do that, and he does it how? Through this opportunity for us to what? To give, to share. And part of that certainly is in the church. So, hint. That's one that Rachel said I needed to put in there, and I think she's right. Answer to question number two. What then, how do we say it? Why does God ask me for my money? Because in the act of giving, selfishness is at least tempered, at least I see the needs of others, and I don't just forget about others. I get out of myself, and I extend myself to help in others' lives. Making sense? That's number two. Now, I want to give uh, acknowledgement to this little book by Ken Long, and uh, I had the opportunity just to notice it at the ABC some time ago and picked it up, and I have really enjoyed it, and I recommend it. Uh, and I am following some of the information that he adapted in this giving equation that's, that's following here. 
it's only like 85 pages, so it's, it's truly uh, an easy read. Uh, he has graphs and all that kind of thing, and, and I think he did a good job. So <clears throat> let's look at the, what he's got to say here about the me economy. You'll find that on the back side of your sheet, gold or green, on the back side. On the left-hand side, you will find the me economy. Um, so we've all received life, and um, here we are. What are we going to do with it? So let's look at uh, number one there, the freedom of independence. This is me economy now, okay? Um, financial security and wealth gives me independence. I can do things that I, I couldn't do without a bank account, without uh, a job. Oftentimes, you know, people talking about a job. It's not the job, it's what the job brings. It's the income. Uh, two, there's this strong commitment to accumulate. Um, the more I get, the better off I'll be, so I must get more, and it becomes almost the purpose of our lives at times. Um, I, boy, I don't like to use the word, I don't like to use the shopping word, but do you know how often that covers a, a lot of stuff? Gotta go shopping. Gotta go shopping. Can become our, it can become our purpose in life. I know I'd stepped on some toes there. Um, keeping up with the Joneses. There's another. I must, I, must get, I, I must have a better model. Yeah, I know I bought that car 10 years ago, but no, I bought it five years ago. But, you know, the new models do this. And um, besides the mileage, I'm going to save a lot of money on better mileage. I must... Um, I must get a newer model. Then there's me first. I can't afford to give. I have to maintain my standard of living. And that's all I can do. You, know, you notice what the standard of living was for the man we just talked about. The standard of living was to have everything he needed so that he could relax and um, hmm, retire. Then there's um, covetousness and greed. <laughs> Somebody's asking for mercy, and we all need to be asking for some of that. Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, watch out for all kinds of greed. And, and one book came up with um, different kinds of greed. One that he mentioned was hoarding. Hmm. Apparently, we feel insecure to the point that we just have to have more stuff, and the stuff stacks up. You ever had that problem? I have that problem with books, folks. I have to, I have to confess that sin here to you because they have a way of accumulating. I think I'm going to read them all. I never get them all read, but I often will buy another one. You ever done that, Pat? <laughs> then there's the greed of comparison. Well, Bob down the street, he has that, he has that nice boat. Boy, don't get into that. Then there's overspending. That's another kind of greed. Got to have it now. Got to have it right now. I have to be gratified that to be able to drive that new boat, that's all, I can, that's all I can think about. Oftentimes they say this thing of immediate gratification or overspending has to do with just being noticed. People like to be noticed. Oh, did you see what he has? And then there's another one called entitlement. We really deserve to have better than we have. 
Society owes it to us. They ought to increase Social Security. Anyway, um, this thing of greed, Jesus says, watch out for all kinds of greed. Luke 12, 15. And then there's immediacy. I think we mentioned that, but I need it. I, I mean, I really need this now. And that's where the credit card often gets us into trouble because it's so easy, isn't it, to pull the card out? And you walk out, I, I don't feel any poor. I still have the cash in my pocket. So I don't need to wait. I can take care of it right now. And then finally, there's this thing of I'm the owner. I'm in charge. I can do whatever I want to. I've purchased it with my own money. I can do whatever I want. So if you purchase it with your own money, what did you really purchase it with? You purchase it with your life, right? It is your life. And I don't know, there's a certain sense of power in all that that the Bible sometimes comes out with, like it does with Nebuchadnezzar when he said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built? I've built it. And when he did that, you know, he looked around and he saw the beauty. And if, you, if you've never seen a picture of some of the buildings and the walls, and, and I mean, Babylon was a strikingly beautiful place. And so... It just inflated his feeling of power to the point that he couldn't turn aside from that. So you and I need to watch out for that kind of thing. It's like, I'm the owner of this, and I'm in charge. Every so often, I need to, I need to walk around my house. I need to look at it when I drive in, and when I drive away, perhaps just stop and take a good look and say, God, it's all yours. It's all yours. And when you need it, and when you want it, let me know. Or I need to do that perhaps with my car even. Lord, it's yours. I'm just borrowing it. I am the manager for right now. I'm the driver, but I don't, it's not mine. So that's the left side. Looking at the right side, let me just uh, scoot along here. Uh, the me economy, what is the underlying principle? It's greed. Okay? And I don't know, did I write that? I don't think I put that at the bottom. You may want to write that at the bottom there. I think that'd be a good foundation thing. Um, and then look at the, the, the right side. Me economy, money equals life. Money minus God's uh, money equals life. Minus God's money. In other words, I'm going to lose money either way. Right? It's going to be gone either way. The question is, do I have God with me or am I in the boat by myself? And that's what we're going to look at here if this will move ahead. Come on. Can you help me advance this? God offers us seven surprises in the G economy, which we can call God economy. Seven surprises that I want you to see. Thank you very much. Let me try it again. There we go. So we're going to look at the God economy. And we have no anxiety lifestyle. In Matthew 6.25, we are told... Not to worry. No anxiety. That's a, one of the greatest promises that I can imagine. Because we have all kinds of anxiety in the world, but don't worry, God says. I will take care of you. That is in Matthew 6, 25, and that's on your sheet. Let's look at number two. Number two, guaranteed necessities. Seek. The kingdom of God and what? All of these things will be added onto you. We just talked about that. All of life's necessities are there for us. Do we really believe that? Well, that's where we need to test God. 
And he will give us that opportunity in some of his promises. Then there is... Um, Reciprocity. There's an exchange going on here. And we will find it there in Luke 6.38. Give and it will be given to you. And this is what I was talking about. A good measure pressed down, shaken together. I give, but God returns in giving and he always gives more. Have you experienced that? I have. kind of interesting in this that, you know, God does not work on the same idea as we do commercially. Because I don't know if you've noticed in the market, you go and you buy a carton of juice or milk or something. Have you noticed how many of these cartons have gotten smaller? Huh? <laughs> a little tricky at times. You, buy the, you think you're buying the same quantity, but you get to... Con did, uh, comparing the content, not the same. But God doesn't work that way. God works with a bigger return. A generous God. So, number four, the abundance effect. Malachi 3.10. If you will open, if you will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out our blessing that you will not have enough room to receive it. Let's read Malachi 3.10 together. I only have part of it there. That's not what I want. Probably the best verse to talk about God's blessing when it comes to tithing, even though offerings are also mentioned. 3.10 Bring all the ties into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. What a promise, huh? God will open his storehouse and give abundantly to us. He is a generous God. The proof challenge comes right after that, number five. Somebody might say, really? God simply says, try it. Put me to the test. And I think that is what he would want all of us to do, is test him. The freedom of dependence is number six. And uh, that simply is pointing out that we, when we depend on God, we have many assurance. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I like what Art Lentz, I've heard him say this a number of times. He said, I'd rather work with 90% and God's blessing than the 100% on my own. I think that's a, good, that's a good statement. Finally, we have becoming more like God. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Paul tells us that if we imitate God, we can be generous as he is. Let me just read this. Imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So what's the, uh, what is the, by the way, that Ephesians 5, it's 1 and 2. I added verses there that aren't necessary. Money equals life. Money minus the money we give to God, if we're on our own, 
or life minus money with God, oh, there's going to be a big difference there. So are we going to do it alone or are we going to do it with him as our partner? And that's where I believe on the final question of the three, we have uh, how will biblical money management change me? I believe it will make me grow in my faith with God so that I can trust him in all circumstances. And I believe it will lead me to live the abundant life. So there are the three answers to the three questions. And I hope somehow that in your walk with God in this time when things are a little stressful about money and money management, that we choose to live the abundant life with God. I'm just going to show you this. Um, there at the bottom of the page, you have that comparison. Take some time and look down through there and just ask yourself the question, do I want to be with the, the God economy or do I want to be with the me economy? And notice the difference between the two. Hoover Dam and um, Lake uh, Mead is a, a very awesome place. I'm sorry to see what's happening to it today, but there are 3.25 million square yards, cube, cubic yards of water in that dam when it's full like that. That's the kind of abundance that God wants to bless us with. I hope we never sell him short. Let's pray. Thank you, God, that you love us. Thank you that, in fact, in this matter of money, you simply want to get involved in our lives. You want us to trust you and let our faith grow as we walk with you in our journey. So, Father, um, please, as we compare this me economy and your economy, may we realize that daily we have choices and may we choose to walk faithfully with you. Thank you that you, above everything else, want to be our partner. So may we trust you and imitate you to the very best of our ability. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.